So you can see that Robert Cecil was a kingmaker and a kingbreaker. It seemed at one point his family, you know, by marrying into Edward de Vere's family, they were sort of angling things so that the Cecils and the de Vere's would inherit. Otherwise, there's no way Edward de Vere could have ever signed his name like that. That would have been like signing your own death warrant had he not got that kind of status at that time. So at one point, the Cecils wanted to Edward de Vere to be king, and then they obviously, I think, I would say probably because of the Prince Tudor situation, it all just got too messy. And Edward de Vere was, you know, became and um, was lost favour, is the polite way of putting it, at court. Robert Cecil, at some point, they made the decision to go for James I there on the right. He was the King of Scotland at the time, who was going to become James VI or something of Scotland. He became James I of England. But this is all in the gift of Robert Cecil. It shows you how kind of influential, powerful he was. I put who knew Alexander War under uh, Edward de Vere. There's a fan, amazing set of videos by a guy called Alexander War, who's part of the he's chairman of the de Vere Society, who do a lot of research into the life and work of Edward de Vere. If you check out this series of stuff on YouTube, who knew, you'll see that at the time, lots and lots of aristocratic people knew that Edward de Vere was the author of the plays, but weren't allowed to kind of say so openly there was some kind of embargo put on it and clever people would show their demonstrate their knowledge of de Vere's authorship of the plays in kind of cryptic ways and Alexander Wall does an amazing fascinating job at showing you all these little hints and sort of puns and things where people were talking about this scandal without talking about it because I think if you'd written it down you know in plain English you'd have gotten serious trouble for explaining this whole Prince Tudor situation. But if you Google who knew Alexander War on YouTube, you'll find a fascinating set of resources. James I was Cecil's king, but not for long. James I made Robert Cecil Earl of Salisbury. That's the, the highest title their family had gained up to that point. And then I think the Cecils still are Earls of Salisbury. But James really, really, really turned things round on Robert Cecil. As soon as James came to court, he just overwhelmed him with work and responsibilities and pressure. And they basically, I think they bullied him to death, you could say. Him and his Scottish mates wanted to just, you know, um, overwhelm him. And he did die very young. Some people have said maybe not naturally, but other, uh, that's not for me to say, I don't know. He died aged 48, very young. James called him his beagle, his little dog. And basically in, in asking James to come down and be king, I, I think, you know, Robert Cecil made a miscalculation. James, like his son and his grandson after him, were all very much in awe of like stronger men. And all it took was a fairly strong commanding personality to be around them and they melted like butter. In James's case, that ended up being a guy called George Villiers, who was a very dashing, good looking, kind of heroic figure, who eventually made Duke of Buckingham. Again, some really, I mean, oh, this is just weird, but uh, George Villiers was clearly James I's lover. But as James became less and less well towards the end of his reign, George Villiers then moved his attentions to James's son, Charles I. And actually, George Villiers was also apparently Charles I's lover as well. So this guy, George Villiers, had a real hold on these two uh, Stuart kings. Through him and people like him, the sort of French-Scottish connection was developed and that led to the whole uh, Year of Miracles situation we've discussed before. James's son, Charles I, under George Villiers' influence, very quickly married Henry Maria, Henrietta Maria Bourbon, and, which is what led to the Civil War, which we've discussed before. But James I was Cecil's choice, but very quickly Cecil lost control of the situation. Really interestingly, probably the last or second to last play Shakespeare wrote, but was Macbeth anyway, and it was deliberately designed to push James I's buttons. James was a very uh, sickly child and a very nervous person. He believed in witches. He believed, I guess people have just been pouring this kind of nonsense in his ear since he was a kid, but he believed the witches were out to get him. He took a boat when he was coming to England to become king from Scotland, and there was a storm, and he seemed convinced 
that was witches. He believed witches were real. Um, and he wrote a book called, the, one of the books he wrote was called The Demonology. And it's literally had the science of going out there and capturing women, uh, ca capturing women. So capturing witches is part of his psychology. He didn't like women, had a very weird relationship with his wife, Anna Denmark. And I'd say this whole witch's phobia is part of his, you know, fear of women. <laughs> but anyway, he definitely, definitely believed witches were really real. He also believed in divine kingship, uh, as he explained in a book called Basilica Dorum, which means the king's gift. He, he really believed he was there because God wanted him to be there, no one else. And he brought this idea of divine right with him to England, even though it didn't exist in Scotland. He wasn't a divine right king in Scotland. By the time he got to England, but to London, he sort of started acting in this divine right manner. By having um, these scenes in Macbeth where the king is killed and then nature kind of falls apart, I think horses start eating each other after the Duncan, the king, is killed. It all sort of really played to James's prejudices. He thought this is how the world worked, and Shakespeare was showing him exactly that in, in his own, you know, in his play. James considered himself a, an ancestor of Banquo, who's like one of the act, uh, characters in the play. Apparently there were special effects and explosions and the king like, was like, you know, absolutely loved it. He was uh, trembling in his seat, absolutely loved Macbeth. It ticked all of his buttons. It's like a psychological key that just un, unpicked his mind and he just felt he, he fell head, head over heels in love with the uh, Shakespearean troop that were the Lord Chamberlain's men. Of course, the Lord Great Chamberlain at the time was Edward de Vere. So Edward de Vere would have been in the audience, from my point of view, watching James I, watching one of his plays that he designed specifically to kind of pal James I up. And it should be remembered that in the audience as well, when Shakespeare, when Macbeth was first performed, would have been Robert Cecil, who only a few years before, you remember, had been caricatured as Richard II in the, in the lead up to the Essex Rebellion. So you've got this sort of group of people who are living very close to each other, who clearly <laughs> trying very hard to, um, you know, manipulate themselves, manipulate the situation into the king's favour. And the play of Macbeth was a genius bit of work, obviously, designed specifically to befriend or, uh, you know, impress the new king. And as is well known, when uh, De Vere died, um, the Lord's Chamberlain's men became the King's men. So literally, such a successful play and such a successful performance that the James that they were made for life after that. All those actors were the King's men. Couldn't get any better than that. And that would have been absolute anathema to Robert Cecil, who, as a Puritan and as a, a kind of a, a bit of a stick in the mud, hated plays, hated entertainments, hated, hated Elizabeth. The fact that Elizabeth liked all these kind of frivolities, as he called them, or would have called them. He wanted James to be very serious, you know, no the grindstone, let's be a serious monarch here. James was entertained by all this. And the court politics, if you, if you like, of these two people who were kind of brothers-in-law, and Cecil was dead by this point, but, you know, Edward de Vere and Robert Cecil were still in 1603 vying for the favour of the monarch. And uh, it's an interesting context for that play. It was deliberately designed to befriend the king. A few years later, Cecil wrote some history, I'm going to say. James had indicated he wanted to be a bit of a peacemaker, uh, married his daughters to Protestant and Catholics and wanted to sort of be a unifying figure. For the Cecils, that was a nightmare because they were very, very invested in Puritanism and divesting them. the old stealing land off the old nobility any way they could find, for any excuse they could find, and focusing on like the more trade-based economy. I mentioned those two guys earlier, Thomas Percy and Robert Catesby. I'm, this isn't my opinion, but I'll show you whose opinion it is in a minute. But in 1601, when the Essex Rebellion happened, he took as many prisoners as he could, and some of those prisoners he returned, you know, to use the spy terminology, into agents who would then spy on other Catholic dissenters across the country. As a result of the 1601 rebellion, Cecil turned a couple of agents, Robert Catesby, Thomas Percy. This is from Wikipedia, right? So it's hardly controversial anymore. It's just like they're being polite about him. 
But this is from Wikipedia. Uh, the principal discoverer of the gunpowder plot, Robert Cecil remains a controversial figure as it's still debated at what point he first learned of the plot and to what extent he acted as an agent provocateur. Now, that's just them being polite. He designed the gunpowder plot as we got till it is nonsense. And I can show you that. I will show you that now. This was a situation created by Cecil to vilify the Catholics and force James I to take a more take a line to a more a religious adopt a religious policy that the Cecil preferred. How do I know this? Well, first of all, you, you know, you might want to ask this guy. This is Henry Percy, uh, the ninth Earl of Northumbria, and he spent 15 years in the Tower of London because Cecil alleged he was part of the, the gunpowder plot. Now, Henry Percy and the Percy family were really, really ancient family, very, very posh, very, very old school, and they, they really resented people like the Cecils who came in and started running the country as well. Henry Percy would have been definitely the kind of guy who would call Robert Cecil just a gentleman. What are you doing in the presence of the Queen? You're not even worthy of it. There was a snobbery there and there were, you know, a lot of history there. Very cleverly, Robert Cecil hired Thomas Percy from the Essex Rebellion and was employed to act as an intermediary between James while he was still in Scotland and Henry, the Earl of Northumberland. Henry was a, a Catholic, a, a very old family, and he was seeking reassurances from James about the treatment of the Catholics when James came to England. And they had several exchanges, letters, correspondence, which Cecil organized to be carried by Thomas Percy. So in James I's mind, whenever he got a message from Henry Percy, the Earl of Northumberland, it was from Thomas Percy, Cecil's delivery man. And the name Percy, as you can see, turns up twice. So from here on out, I'm gonna call Thomas Percy, Thomas Percy, and Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland, the Earl. So we're going to call Henry Percy, this guy, looking very bored, because he spent 15 years in the Tower of London for no reason. He's the Earl, and Thomas Percy, I'm just going to call Thomas Percy. So James I, because of Robert Cecil hiring him, associated Thomas Percy with the Earl. And on November the 5th, 1605, Thomas Percy visited the Earl, at Zion House, which is near London. And that was the reason why Cecil said he was clearly implicated in the gunpowder plot. Cecil said, look, your majesty, this man, Thomas Percy, who is part of the plot, and by that time being killed, was part of the plot, was visiting the Earl on the day of the plot. And that was enough reason for James I to go, all right, then and put him in prison. Henry Percy, the ninth, the Earl, knew he had nothing to do with the gunpowder plot, because he, he was there, you know, he knew he was innocent. And he knew that Cecil's employee, Thomas Percy, had been used to implicate him. He was very angry about that. As you can imagine, he, he spent some of the best years of his life, 15 odd years, in the Tower of London for something he knew he'd been set up on. He knew it was a set up. And, you know, eventually he was allowed to go, he was allowed out, not because any legal situation had changed. I mean, by that time, by 1621, when he was let out of the Tower of London, Robert Cecil was dead. Really, he'd, he'd been left to languish there. And really, what James was doing was shaking him down for money. He ended up paying £30,000 to the king for his release from the Tower of London for something he'd never done. So Henry Percy and the Earls of Northumberland were not fans of Robert Cecil or, and were not convinced by his talk of the gunpowder plot. And that's a matter of very ancient record from since the time. And I'll show you other people who were at the time very sceptical as well. Between being released after the ex rebellion and the time of the gunpowder plot, Robert Catesby and Thomas Percy went around trying to recruit members of the family close to the Earl, close to the Earl of Northumbria, close to Henry Percy. And they created a kind of uh, pro-Catholic cell, like a terrorist cell, you could say nowadays, all around Catesby and Percy, and with a couple of other people, really went healthy, let them were really indiscreet, would sort of say it out loud, we're plotting to kill the king, do you want to come with us? And they kept referring to the coming rule, or once he was crowned, the rule of James I, he was a tyrant, that they kept saying it, and they'd say it in quite public and not very subtle ways. So they went around recruiting people. 
Another thing they did was they confessed an awful lot to Jesuit priests. They actually just went up to priests and said, oh, yeah, well, we're going to blow up Parliament. We're going to kill the king. We're going to do all this stuff. So one specific instance of this, Robert Catesby confesses to a guy called Oswald Tesimond. And Tesimond now knows about a, you know, a plot to kill the king. Because of his vows, he can't tell anyone about it. You can't break the confession. So the way he gets around that is Tesman then confesses to his mate, his fellow Jesuit, Henry Garnet, on the 24th of July, 1605. Henry Garnet was one of the chief Jesuits in England at the time. And they were like, oh my God, this is a, like, so for them, it was really obvious, Catesby and Percy, the idea of trying to blow up the king was not going to be good for Catholics in England. It was a ridiculously bad idea, unnecessary, you know, just mental. Henry Garnet wrote to the Jesuit general, right, who's the top of the Jesuit order, and got him to ask the Pope to issue a general letter saying, never, no Catholic is allowed to attack the lawful king. The Jesuits organised for the Pope to try and prevent this happening. Like the Pope did issue some kind of letter saying no Catholic is ever justified in attacking a lawful king. Now, what Garnet and people like him did back in England was say, look what the Pope said, you can't, you can't attack the king, it's not allowed. So they were actively trying to dissuade people from taking part in this plot. And their letters are a matter of record now, but what actually happened was after the plot blew up, that someone somehow had a list of all the people, Catesby and the others, all the, you know, all the people they'd confessed to. So all those people that were confessed to were arrested and said, you know, were questioned, did you know about this plot? Yes. Why didn't you tell us about it? Because of confession. All right, then you're, you're traitors. And Garnet, who had gone out of his way to get the Pope to say, don't do this, was actually hung, drawn and quartered. Cecil wanted to make the Jesuits the bad guys. For hundreds of years, it was all a Jesuit plot, the evil Jesuits doing it. But actually, you can see in the written record that the Jesuits went out of their way to try and stop this plot and were nevertheless incriminated very skillfully. So I think this is a picture of Henry Garnet, uh, who some people think should be a saint because he did go out of his way to try and protect the king and never, you know, despite all of that, died in the most horrific way that's known to man. It's horrific what happened to these people. And they were totally traduced from centuries. But again, all of this is a matter of record from, from paperwork at the time. And I'll show you where you can find a bit more out about this. Another thing you don't get taught at school because it's just so absurd. This happened on the 8th of November. And this is before Guy Fawkes had been caught on the 5th of November, but didn't start confessing. Didn't say anything for about a week. Didn't even tell them their name. Nevertheless, Catesby and Percy and about 30 of their co-conspirators were holed up in a place called Holbecker House, about 150 miles away from London. And the entire place was surrounded by guards. Somehow, all of the conspirators had given away their location and they were all surrounded by, I think it was a sheriff of Worcester or something like that. There was a lot of people, soldiers surrounding them in this place, Holbecker House, and they kind of knew they were in deep, deep trouble. Remember this happened before Guy Fawkes said a word. The morning of the, what they knew was going to be some kind of face-off between them in Holbecker House, the conspirators and the, and the soldiers around them, they decided to hold a meeting. Thomas Percy put a room together so they could all, all hold a meeting, put benches out, and in the middle of the room there was a big barrel. And on that barrel he placed a brazier with loads of sort of, you know, hot burning coals in them, and that was to make the room warm. So everyone got in the room for this meeting. Thomas Percy put the brazier on top of this barrel and said, I'll tell you what, lads, I'll just go and get some nice warm drinks. And when he did that, uh, his mate Robert Catesby was just sort of playing with the fire a bit. Some of the hot coals fell down out of the brazier into the barrel. What Thomas Percy had forgotten to tell his friends is he's actually put two 15 pound bags of gunpowder into the barrel. So when the, the coals from the brazier fell into the barrel, the whole thing exploded. Now, only one of the two bags exploded and no one in the room, I think, was killed. But certainly, <laughs> certainly 
the roof was blown off. Everyone, I think everyone lost eyebrows, went deaf. You know, there was a big explosion. And this is actually the only explosion that the uh, gunpowder you know, gun plot has ever managed to create. If you look at history books today, they'll say that the gunpowder plotters were drying their gunpowder because it got wet and that's why it exploded. Now you might believe what was written by someone in the last 20 or 30 years and published, but I'd suggest you look at actually what the attorney general at the time said, because he was very clear and had witnesses that the powder in the barrel taking fire blew up the roof of the house and the linen bag set under the platter fell down in the courtyard, whole and unfired which would have slain them all if it had exploded. You can look at the actual, what the Attorney General said happened, and that is what he said happened. Thomas Percy, presumably <coughs> because he'd been asked to, got all his mates together in a single room and blew it up. And unfortunately for him, only one of the two bags of gunpowder he put in that barrel exploded. If the second bag had exploded, they'd definitely all be dead. And Thomas Percy would have probably walked away with a healthy pension. But that isn't what happened in the end. The plotters were all a bit disorientated by the big explosion. They wanted to know what the hell had gone on. And then basically they started having a go at Percy, as you well would in the circumstances. But in the, in the ensuing kind of confusion, both Catesby and Percy and several others were, were killed as the, fort of the, you know, the king's forces moved in. Interestingly, both Percy and Catesby were killed by the same bullet, which makes it sound to me either the guy who shot them was some kind of, I don't know, <laughs> trick shotter, or they were executed. I mean, it sounds much more likely they were they were kneeling down, they'd, they'd surrendered or whatever, and someone put a bullet through both of their heads. Now, I did used to know this guy's name, the, the, the marksman, but I could fish it out, but he was certainly paid a, a pension of 40 shillings a year for the rest of his life for, let's say, cutting this knot and completely distancing you know with these two dead there was absolutely no way you could, con con could concretely tie this back to Percy so by, by killing Percy and Catesby with their deaths Robert Cecil was very easily able to wash his hands of this because there were no other links to him that existed. Back in London this is a few days before Guy Fawkes was caught not a lot of people know <laughs> that the, the house that they uh, were building the tunnel, because they built a tunnel from, the, from a house into the basement, the House of Commons. The house they rented was actually belonged to a guy called Sir Dudley Carlton, who was a friend of Cecil's and later became ambassador to Venice. So you can only say no suspicion fell on him whatsoever. He just rented this house right by Parliament to all these Catholic nutters. Uh, they built a tunnel nearly killed everyone but absolutely no it wasn't your fault Dudley there was something odd about Sir Dudley Carton just getting you know not even being questioned or, or, or being implicated in any way in a plot which would have been impossible without his property and as I say he was he was a friend of Cecil so other people I'd have said including uh, the Earl of Northumberland would have drawn other conclusions now famously a guy called Lord Monteagle showed Cecil an anonymous letter uh, on the 26th of October, but Cecil didn't order a search because this letter said, oh, don't go to the opening of Parliament, Lord Monteagle, because those that go will receive some terrible blow. Something like that, the, the implication being like, don't go, it's dangerous. Monteagle showed Cecil, showed Cecil just as all his, uh, Cecil was holding a meeting with some other nobles and this guy Lord Monteagle turned up at just the right time with a letter saying oh there's something going to happen at the opening of parliament. Cecil did nothing for a few for over a week but managed to order a search just as Guy Fawkes was in place with 36 barrels of gunpowder. Ridiculously lucky you could say. Now 36 barrels of gunpowder you could say like that be the equivalent of 36 nuclear warheads today. I mean a barrel of gunpowder was a load of trouble. You know, you did not get to keep gunpowder as a private citizen. All the stores of gunpowder should have been at the Tower of London. And where you get 36 barrels of gunpowder from, lots of people have said that's just, that would have been very, very difficult. And coincidentally, the records for 1605 at the Tower of London went missing. So it's absolutely impossible to say whether those barrels of gunpowder were already in London and got taken out of the tower and then maybe got 
put back once the, the uh, clock was boiled. 36 barrels of gunpowder is a, sh is a ridiculous amount. And um, it had been very, 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 very difficult to get into the country. And as I say, the official records that Robert Cecil would have had responsibility for, or at least power over, went missing. So I would suggest those barrels of gunpowder were incredibly easy for the plotters to uh, acquire because they were laid on for them. When it came to the trial that we've seen was organised for the survivors of Hellbacker House, because it was treason, there was no, they weren't allowed any defence lawyers at all. They were tortured and made confessions and on the, on the basis of those confessions they were tried. Certain signatures people say were definitely forged um, and forged under tortures. You've got this signature underneath, this is Guy Fawkes' normal signature, and that's how he signed his name to his confession. You can see he was under quite a lot of stress. Yeah, and uh, for example, a guy called Thomas Wintour, T-O-U-R, for some reason, <laughs> misspelt his own surname and spelt it winter, but the season, in his confession. It's pretty clear a lot of these confessions were came out under torture and were, some of them were just forged. I wanted to show you this image of Guy Fawkes, you know, this kind of classic image, because I think we've all seen it. And what some people point out is this was like a meme in 1605. Loads and loads and loads of different depictions of Guy Fawkes with a key, with a lantern at a gate, with the moonlight and people around him. Loads and loads of people spontaneously drew a very, very, very similar image. And it was kind of like propaganda. Almost overnight, Guy Fawkes became infamous. A lot of different artists associated with the state decided to depict him in exactly the same manner. It was kind of like propaganda. I liked when someone pointed out it's very much like an early meme. And I just thought it was fun because, you know, it shows the sort of level of rhetoric that was going on, the level of discussion at the time, because this was definitely a pamphlet put about to persuade people of this story. And it says, infernal thoughts with demonic heart, being ready now to act his hellish part, booted and spurred with lantern in his hand, and matches in pocket at door doth stand. But Lord Knevitt, by divine direction, him apprehends and finds the plot's detection. And it's like, I don't know, it's like Mills and, I, I don't know, it's just childlike in its depiction of it all, demonic heart. I mean, it's just all propaganda. It's a meme. I thought it was kind of interesting that memes existed so long ago. Um, to the sort of, just to finish this off, uh, there's a lovely quote from the guy who was the Bishop of Gloucester at the time, who just said, Cecil would first contrive and then discover a treason. He'd make something up and then say, look what I found. It's an indication of, you know, who gets to write our history, that even people at the time were really, really clear. This is a very suspicious set of circumstances. All kinds of people at the time <laughs> pointed this out, not least the Earl of Northumbria who was like, well, look, how did I end up in the Tower of London? He had lots of friends, the Earl of Northumbria. They're all pretty clear what was going on. But yet, you know, 300 years, 400 years later, we still get taught the same stuff. That's, that's the power of Robert Cecil. He wrote our history for us, even though a lot of it is fiction. So he died unloved in 1612. Like I say, he never really, he never really had any people who were close to him, apart from maybe his father. And he did. He rewrote our history. You know, for Elizabeth I, he decided who would who would inherit. I mean, I think if you accept the Prince Tudor or some hypothesis like that, that she did have children, which she, you know, almost certainly did. The Spanish ambassador in 1561 said she got ill with a sickness that made her belly swell, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. She had kids, but he managed to disinherit them all in whatever way, for whatever reason. And when it came to James I, he tried to terrify him. It was already a bit of a, a delicate character. He tried to terrify him using the Guy Fawkes scenario into being anti-Catholic. So you can see why he was incredibly skilled. I mean, incredibly clever, no doubt. Fiendishly, ingeniously, you know, plotting these things, orchestrating these things, died completely unloved, which I think is probably what he deserved. Because he was obviously... Not a nice guy, purely about power. He's powerful enough that his lies are our history. Robert Cecil, author of history. You know, none of this is really my research. This is just stuff I've read in books.
I really, really recommend anyone who's interested in the Shakespeare thing to check out uh, Shakespeare's unorthodox biography. This lady, Diana Price, gone into the records, all the literary records for poets and writers at the time. Uh, you know, uh, who are the famous ones like Christopher Marlowe, Ben Johnson, you know, people you've heard of, and then all kinds of people I've never heard of. But she just goes through and shows how much writing of theirs exists. Like for Ben Johnson, it's like pages and pages, like feet thick of books that he wrote by hand. And Marlowe, the same. All these guys wrote huge things in their letters, all bound together in these huge folios. But all of them, except Shakespeare, which where there's only his six signatures that look like, you know, a spider on acid. Really, really I mean, it's just factual, evidence-based. Shakespeare's unorthodox biography. And this is actually the book that a guy called Sir Derek Jacobi, who's an actor, recommends. He's, a, he's an Oxfordian, if you like. He doesn't think William Shakespeare wrote the plays. Other great actors, one guy, Mark Rylance, who, if you've seen Don't Look Up, was really scary in that. He's um, an, a Shakespeare expert. He recommends this book. Lots and lots of people say, look, if you really want to be, if you care about evidence, read Diana Price's book. End of argument. The guy in the middle is Alexander War. He's the chairman of the De Vere Society, and he does some amazing stuff on YouTube that uh, really, really, really goes incre into incredible depth and detail about Edward De Vere, Robert Cecil, the whole kind of politics of the era and why and how Edward De Vere was written out of history. Uh, guy Fawkes, the real story of the gunpowder plot, exclamation mark. This, uh, this guy, Francis Edward, was a Jesuit, and he just went through the the, the history, the records of the Jesuit order, read the letters of these people going, we've just been confessed to, these guys are going to try and blow up James I. They're meant help. <laughs> you know, Jesuits who were hung, drawn and quartered and made, at the time, demonised for responsibility for that plot. Their letters pleading for help because they know they're, they're being kind of trapped by this situation. So it's completely clear the Jesuits did not have anything to do with the gunpowder plot. The only motive forces behind it were really Catesby and Percy, and they were in the employ of Robert Cecil. So Robert Cecil created the gunpowder plot, not some poor sod who got, you know, caught. Guy Fawkes wasn't, Ed didn't really have anything to do with it. He's just, the, he was the fool guy, he was the mean. Yeah. <laughs>